Somebody once described rugby as a thug's game played by gentlemen. Peter's the inside center, guys. Peter McKay thinks politics should be more like rugby. The ball's going to go to come to Peter. Go on! He's a 35-year-old MP from Nova Scotia. Yes. That's it, that's it. And a lot of wise old politicians think that he just might be onto something. Tory Senator Norman Atkins. He's bright. He has quick responses. He has a... I think the political touch that some people talk at uh, talk about the potential royal jealousy. Nova Scotia has produced a lot of famous politicians, including several prime ministers and a few near misses. Peter McKay's roots run deep in Nova Scotia politics and Pictou County, where the McKays made a lot of money in lumbering. My granddad was was born and died in the same room in this little house. My father would be the fourth generation to be on this farm, and I hope to be the fifth. On this visit home, a symbolic gesture, planting some acorns from Quebec, where perhaps significantly he's been learning French lately. I'm going to plant those acorns that I took uh, from Sir Wilfrid Laurier's tree outside the Quebec legislature out here. He isn't the first McKay to raise a high profile in national politics. Uh, we've, over the years, acquired a lot of land and looked after our forests. His father is Elmer McKay, featured on the Fifth Estate more than 25 years ago when he was an aggressive parliamentary critic of the justice system. I've just been told that there's a live recording device hidden in one of the chairs in my office that it's fully operative. Do you believe that this bug could have been planted either by the government or by the police? The bug could have been planted by anyone, as far as that goes. While his father was fighting bugs in Ottawa, Peter and his three siblings were growing up in what, from the outside, seemed to be idyllic circumstances. Of course, going to school, you can see we'd always come over and have apple fights in the, uh, in the orchard. And there was a brook. It was a ready-made place for a kid to grow up. That's the school, yeah. It's hard to believe. It's like something at a little house on the prairie. I just caught the tail end of the one-room schoolhouse generation. I used to think of it as this huge, big place, but it was just, uh, there was about 30 kids. I had one other kid in my grade, Beverly York. She used to copy off me. But there was a darker side to it all. Elmer was a mostly absentee parent, caught up in political intrigues, dumping one party leader, helping usher in a new one. Brian Mulroney arrived in Central Nova with Elmer McKay, the MP who gave up his seat for the new Conservative leader. Elmer McKay soon had his seat back, and a seat in the Mulroney cabinet, along with the man they helped get rid of, Joe Clark. But politics had helped turn his family's bucolic world inside out. Your folks uh, went their separate ways. Your father was in, in Ottawa all the time. How much of that is, uh, how much of that is, is part of your, your makeup? That was, without a doubt, a very, very difficult time. I mean, I was, I was eight years old. I had uh, brothers and sisters. My mother, uh, God bless her, did, did amazing things uh, in raising a family, went back to school, um, took a very demanding job. His mother raised the children, but her eldest son seemed determined to follow in his father's footsteps. He even spent a year at Carleton University in Ottawa to be nearer to his dad, at least physically. The emotional distance remained, however, and he finished his education in Nova Scotia. Um, you know, I think every kid grows up wanting their parents' approval. Um, and, uh, you know, my dad was in the thick of it at that time. After law school, he returned to Pictou County to work as a Crown Prosecutor, where he started forming his own views on justice. I saw things that I, I felt needed to be changed in the law. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of work with the Young Offenders Act. In 1997, then-Tory leader Jean Charest invited the young lawyer to become a lawmaker. This wasn't some predetermined path that I was on, and uh, my father never openly or actively encouraged me to do this. In oh, fact, I think he was surprised. Peter McKay, 1008. February 97, his nomination against three other candidates would be his toughest fight. He won the seat in the June election that year by more than 5,000 votes, and he took to Parliament as if he'd been born for the job. The absolute loss of any remaining shred of credibility that government and Parliament might have in this country is on the chopping block. 
Charest appointed him Tory House leader, and like his father before him, he became a justice critic. Unlike Elmer, he's emerged as a hardline advocate of law and order. You mentioned the Young Offenders Act. Did I read right that you want to put 10-year-olds on trial and, and, and put them in jail? No, you didn't read that right. But there are occasions when we should, we should have that discretion to, uh, to treat a young person seriously when they commit a serious crime. But how re responsible, really, is the 10-year-old kid who, who maybe doesn't even know his way home from school yet? Well, that's the victim. You're just as dead if you're killed by a 10-year-old or a 14-year-old. What about the death penalty? Well, everybody has their own personal view on that. Um, my own is that if the evidence is there, and if it's ironclad, then I, I believe that there are crimes that warrant the ultimate punishment. He'd been in Ottawa less than a year when Jean Charest left to lead the Quebec Liberals. Charest thought he should seek the party's leadership. He quickly declined. Have you got any regrets now that uh, maybe you didn't bite the hook at that particular time? No regrets. As, as one fellow said to me back home, uh, you're a little wet behind the ears for that, son. And uh, <laughs> I think that was... be Elmer McKay, would it? Well, it could have been. <laughs> it was sage advice. I think there's, uh, there's always a danger of getting in the ring too early. Or as Elmer learned, getting in the ring at all. In 1993, he retired back to Pictou County. I'm very proud of Peter being in politics. He never gave me any indication that he wanted to get involved in this amazing profession, which Bismarck called the only one for which no formal training is required. One of your strengths is that you have history, you have a political tradition. The K McKay name goes back into the Mulroney administration. But yet the Mulroney era is still suffering from images of scandal and controversy. Will that raise a perception problem? I would say compared to the current administration, um, it's no more scandalous. But let's put it in, into a perspective. Uh, I was in high school when Mr. Mulroney was the Prime Minister. But the scandals of the Mulroney days still resonate, few more persistently than the Airbus aircraft deal and the man at the center of it, Karl Heinz Schreiber, a wanted man in Germany, counts among his most loyal friends, Elmer McKay. I've known him for some time, and I find him to be a good friend. That's as far as it goes, and I don't desert my friends. Uh, it seemed to me that he really stuck his neck out uh, in going to bed for Karl Heinz Schreiber at some potential cost for the, the, the next generation of McKay politicians. My father uh, is a very loyal person, which again is, is a quality that uh, I think is admirable, particularly in public life. And it's not when you're experiencing high times that, uh, that you gauge the quality of your friends. Uh, it's when things are tough. Peter's best friend is Mike Misio, an Ontario golf pro. To him, Peter is to politics what Tiger Woods is to golf. He had been in the politics all his life. By the time he officially got his tour card, he was already, uh, he was already schooled. He was, he was a veteran from day one. When they were young guys hanging out together, Mike saw how politics had damaged his friend's private life. They made a $100 wager once over who would be the first one to be married. Mike wasn't a bit surprised when Peter lost. Girls he wasn't perfect with, that's all. He, when he had a good girl, he kind of... Um, but he had an agenda, so the girls were, uh, were second. For two years in a row, he's been voted sexiest man on Parliament Hill, but perhaps with his father's two failed marriages in mind, he's avoided permanent commitments so far. So how did you manage to stay single so long? <laughs> well, I mean, that's... Uh... I guess that's just a personal decision that everybody makes. Public life takes its toll on the people that you're around, and um, you know that is something I'm very concerned about. So when's it going to happen? Oh, I, I I expect it will happen at, at some point. Uh. Want a hot chocolate? His buddy Mike Misio thinks he's overcautious, and not just in matters of the heart. Mike thought he should have gone after his party's leadership four years ago when Charest urged him to. I thought. Uh, uh, you know, if you're a backup quarterback and the starter goes down, do you, do you say, I'm not ready, coach? Uh, maybe he was right. 
Maybe his time uh, wasn't then, maybe it's now. <laughs> well, not quite. The party has a leader now, and it's unlikely Joe Clark has forgotten that Peter's father was part of a putsch that dumped him almost 20 years ago. Joe Clark, Clark. how are you? Great. Oh, thanks. Good. Good. We're good to meet you. I was going to say Joe Hoover. You're probably tired of hearing that. No, no, I'm tired of hearing that. <laughs> Peter McKay was conspicuously helpful when Clark ran for a common seat in Nova Scotia last fall. Peter McKay is my name. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm down here uh, campaigning, actually, with... With, with Mr. Clark. I'm traveling with his daughter, actually. I'm 90 years old. Well, you look 10 years younger. And we McKay worked hard to prove himself the loyal soldier, consciously distancing himself from the Tory tradition of savaging weak leaders. How are you going to escape the, oh, there's Brutus again. Well, there, there go the McKays again. That This time, Peter is a stalking horse for Elmer. And they're going to get Joe again. I think there's a lot of myth surrounding that uh, that whole scenario that you've just laid out. People forget that my father uh, sat cabinet with Joe Clark for nine years. Um, I'm not going to say that they're uh, the best of friends, but they're friends and they're colleagues. In September, Joe Clark easily won the Nova Scotia by-election, but still couldn't escape the questions about his future in the party. Peter McKay has asked straight out if it's time to review Joe Clark's performance. It's absolutely not the time for leadership review. What we need is solidarity, we need people working together, and we need people supporting the leader. And uh, that's pretty clear. Thanks very much. Okay, no problem. You know that the guy that they're talking about to replace Mr. Clark is here, right? This is where a politician lives or dies on instinct. One wrong word, um, and it's all over. We've got a leader, put it that way. That's, uh, that's where I am on that issue. The party has a leader, but even he's not sure for how much longer. The Canadian political scene has changed fundamentally since Joe Clark first showed up here more than 30 years ago. His return to the House of Commons is the feel of a farewell tour. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present to you the Right Honourable Joe Clark. The party has become less progressive, more conservative. Aging progressive conservatives have become political curiosities. Conservative conservatives are looking for a messiah, but they aren't exactly sure they've found him yet. There is a place for conservative policies in this country. Uh, Chantal Bear is a political columnist for the Toronto Star. But it takes a, a much better mix than what the Alliance put together. And it's going to take more than Joe Clark showing the Tory flag for people to come back to a party saying, well, gee, you know, we used to like them. Late November in a Pictou County hockey rink, Peter McKay was campaigning again, this time for his own re-election. There wasn't much doubt about the outcome. Well, I'll let you watch the game. This is yeah, important well, stuff. He was always expected to win. They were afraid to... Uh, Election night, the results are almost a foregone conclusion. But in the midst of all the political activity, close friends and family have noticed that Peter's closely guarded private life has become a bit less private. Lisa Merrithew, daughter of a former Mulroney cabinet minister from New Brunswick, was front and center in the campaigning. Victor Lanigan is guys, bro. This is no surprise. Peter McKay has won another term in Parliament. He's here the yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the most eligible bachelors in Ottawa seems to be heading back, just a little less eligible. All right. Well, Mike, the Ontario charm works, for sure. Local Tories celebrate the re-election of their candidate. The candidate has to think of the larger picture, of the Liberal steamroller and the upstart alliance, perhaps wiping out his party completely. At the end of the evening, they barely cling to party status, 12 seats. Joe Clark's was number 11. How's he doing? Joe Clark is declared elected. That's what they're saying on CTV. You and I together, we did the impossible. The impossible in this case was to have survived a near-death experience for now. Within weeks, Clark would be musing about stepping down and pundits predicting a marriage on the right. Thanks to the last election and the alliance's failure in Ontario, there is a very small opportunity for the Tories to be an agent of change of the alliance. The fact that the alliance needs to uh, graft a, a Tory soul of some kind on itself it's, if it's going to go further is very important. Uh, so 
if I were a young man in politics, I would find that fun and challenging, but it can be turned into so little, it can turn into dust so easily. The conventional wisdom around here is that one of these days, your party and the Alliance Party are going to have to stand in front of the altar and take a vow of unity. When is that likely to come, in your view? I'm not sure that it will. Uh, not officially, but the talking is certainly beginning. Where do you fit in it? Because another piece of the conventional wisdom around here is that, that you might be a leader in this new united right. Well, again, that, uh, that isn't entirely up to me. You're not exactly heading out the door when I raise the possibility. Well, one thing I did learn from Jean Charest is you never say never. Uh, you never close doors. Four years ago, he wasn't ready to replace a party leader. Two years from now, he may well have to consider replacing two. I do swear, I do swear, that I will be faithful, that I will be faithful. And the larger question, whether or not he wants to lead the country. Growing up, he learned enough about politics not to be seduced by power. Do I have this burning desire uh, to be the prime minister of this country? I would have to say uh, no. The legacy of a life shaped by politics is not ambition, but ambivalence. Uh, it, it may be an awesome honor and, and task, but uh, there's also an awesome price associated with it. Um, so. In some ways, thankfully, I, it's not a decision that I have to make right now.